Well, welcome to episode 254 of 10 Minute Record Reviews. And this time we're going to talk about Pete LaRocca's, frankly, fantastic record from 1965, Basra. And what I've got here is a Blue Note 80th anniversary pressing, uh, which, frankly, is excellent. It's like an out of body experience. The only quibble I have is, as with a lot of early stereo mixes, uh, the saxophone is panned way over to the left, and my question is, why always over to the left? Ever since it came out, this record has had few challengers in terms of what Pete LaRocca's best release ever was, but no sooner had he begun to dine at jazz's top table than he began to fall away, in particular to fall out of step with prevailing jazz trends towards electric jazz and free jazz, and within three years, he was out of jazz altogether and would remain so for over a decade. Pete LaRocca was born in Harlem in April 1938, and I think the first thing to mention about him is that his real name was not Pete LaRocca, but in fact, Pete Sims. Growing up, he studied percussion at the High School of Music and Art in Manhattan, and as a teenager too, he got experience initially playing in the big Latin music boom coming out of East Harlem in the day, playing timbales with a lot of different Latin combos. It's that environment which encourages him to take the stage name Pete LaRocca, or Pete the Rock, and it also provides him with a very distinctive style which shows up on this record and at other points in his career. In New York in the 1950s, the famous DJ Symphony Sid used to arrange for jam sessions every Monday evening at Birdland when the regular act would have the night off. One such jam session in 1957 had Pete LaRocca attend as a 19-year-old drummer. He played and he caught the attention of Max Roach. Roach in turn recommends him to Sonny Rollins, who was experimenting at the time with the whole idea of a trio without a piano, which was a relatively revolutionary idea at the time. Given the occasional role of piano in jazz as a percussive instrument, its absence therefore brings more attention on the drummer, and LaRocca's facility was instantly attractive to Rollins, and between 1957 and 1959, LaRocca forms part of Rollins' club trio, along with Donald Bailey on bass. That lineup can be found playing on Rollins' excellent live release, A Night at the Village Vanguard. Originally, they only included one track which had LaRocca playing, but subsequent expanded re-releases have included the whole set. In 1959, he can be heard in a Jackie McLean record, New Soil, and also on a record by the clarinetist Tony Scott called Golden Moments, along with Bill Evans on piano and the bassist Jimmy Garrison. So an amazing lineup, but really not that amazing a record, except for one track called Minor Apprehension, which features Quite a significant solo by LaRocca, which is distinctive for basically being a free jazz solo. It's unconstrained by the need to keep time. It's well in advance of other kinds of efforts in terms of free jazz drumming in the 1960s. Although, ironically enough, despite having been an innovator, apparently LaRocca was never a big fan of free jazz and didn't join its adherents when the new decade rolled around. LaRocca gets a big break in the spring of 1960 with the opportunity to play with John Coltrane. Now, Coltrane had until that point been with Miles Davis's band, which was increasingly like a small town with one musical genius too many, and this kind of became apparent on the last tour that Coltrane did with Davis in Europe in the spring of 1960. Coltrane leaves Davis after that tour back in New York, and he's starting to experiment with a quartet format. Of course, we know where that leads with the classic quartet from the beginning of 1962, but the earliest version of Coltrane's post-Davis quartet includes Steve Kuhn on piano, Steve Davis on bass, and on drums, at Miles Davis's suggestion, Pete LaRocca. He didn't last long, and it was a challenging experience to match his style with Coltrane's. Ultimately, didn't work out, although LaRocca found the whole experience very invigorating, and ultimately, it's no shame to have been replaced by Elvin Jones. You can actually hear that version of Coltrane's quartet on a recording made at the Jazz Gallery on June 27, 1960, which is available on an official release, which is a compilation of CDs called Training In. But the sound is very obviously a bootleg recording. It's not that great, but it does exist. For LaRocca, that short-lived quartet lineup with Coltrane was the beginning of a fairly lengthy association with their piano player, Steve Kuhn. They would go on to work together quite a lot in the 1960s, including some work with the bassist Scott LaFaro in 1960 and 61. That same trio was recruited by Stan Getz in the early part of 1961, as he was looking to form a more lasting quartet, and they can be heard on one track available on a Getz compilation made in February of that year, which was a version of Sonny Rollins' track, Arrogant. Pete was replaced by another legendary drummer, Roy Haynes, apparently because Scott LaFaro found, as a bass player, he could not lock into LaRocca's playing because it was very cymbal-heavy and he wanted more of a drum beat. 
So for Pete LaRocca by 1961, it was just not happening in groups. So he had to make ends meet and he got a fair amount of work as a sideman. A year or two later, he hooks up again with Steve Kuhn, who's playing with Art Farmer's group. And with Farmer, they make a great record called Sing Me Softly of the Blues, which I hadn't heard before, but I gave a bit of a listening of the day and we'll definitely be picking that one up and I recommend it. However, LaRocca's fortunes really do take a turn for the better in 1963, when he's tapped by Blue Note Records to appear along with the saxophonist Joe Henderson as sidemen on a record for Johnny Coles called Little Johnny C. This record's largely been forgotten until recently, but it is an excellent slice of bluesy hard bop. And importantly, this gets LaRocca in good with Alfred Lyon, who of course was the supremo and the kingmaker at Blue Note Records. And so he ends up playing Henderson's first two records as a leader, which are both excellent, page one in 1963 and Our Thing in 1964. He can also be heard on another Blue Note record from around this time, Freddie Hubbard's The Night of the Cookers, which was a live date recorded in April 1965. And on the strength of that, Alfred Lyon invites him to come and record his own record as a leader, and that's where we get Basra. This record is made May 19, 1965, at Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, in Rudy Van Gelder's studio. Van Gelder, of course, is the engineer, and Alfred Lyon is the producer. Pete LaRocca is on drums, Steve Kuhn is on piano, Steve Swallow is on bass, and Joe Henderson is on tenor. Swallow, of course, is one of the standout avant-garde bassists from the early 1960s, and he was part of that, frankly, criminally underappreciated trio that Jimmy Jeffrey had, also including Paul Blay. The recording session itself apparently had a number of peculiarities. Apparently, LaRocca's perfectionism really came to the fore. Steve Kuhn also manages to piss off Rudy Van Gelder by manually reaching in and plucking the strings of the grand piano, which Rudy had in the studio. And on top of all this, both Steve Swallow and Pete LaRocca had both dropped acid before showing up at the studio, and Swallow remembers going to the bathroom at Rudy's to see that Rudy was one of the very first people to have the blue toilet water with the disinfectant, and Swallow was absolutely transfixed by this for an extended period of time. Following the release of this record, LaRocca, who had been involved in quite a lot of stuff leading up to it by Lyon, then fell out with Lyon and never really does any significant work with Blue Note again. In the rest of the 1960s, he only releases one more record as a leader, which is Turkish Women at the Bath, released on Douglas Records in 1967. That's actually got Chick Corea on it. He'd been driving a cab to make ends meet. 1968 comes around and you can see the writing on the wall, free jazz, jazz funk, electric jazz are the things that are happening and so he decides to pack it in and go to law school and find a different way to make a living at least for a time. The record starts with Malaquena which is a Latin standard by the Cuban composer Ernesto Lacona. This is an amazing track, it's hypnotic and La Roca's use of symbols, which of course was something that Scott LaFerro had complained about, actually really worked to the benefit of this track, a lot of the reason why it works Joe Henderson's playing here, too, is an absolute revelation. He finds a way to mimic both the trumpet stylings and the vocal stylings of flamenco. His technique here is incredible, especially in the vibrato. Can Do, which is a La Roca number, is a blues with excellent contributions from both Kuhn and Henderson over this kind of stuttering, stumbling drum figure from La Roca. The final track on side one, Tears Come From Heaven, which is also a La Roca tune, has got some really great playing by Steve Kuhn, over top of this very gentle, delicate, almost rainfall-like pattern by La Roca. The only real downfall is the melody is not that memorable. Side 2 starts with La Roca's tremendous composition, Basra, probably along with Melaguena, the highlight of the record. The modal song construction works extremely well with the Arab music styles, and La Roca's extended solo towards the end works really, really well, especially when punctuated with Kuhn's piano fills. Lazy Afternoon is a Broadway standard. It's a lovely ballad with a very sensitive solo from Henderson. The record closes with a composition by Steve Swallow called Eiderdown. Funnily enough, I'm not as taken with Swallow's playing on his own track as I am with his other work in the record. This is, I think, probably the least well-worked out track on the album. I wouldn't be surprised if it was the last one they recorded. This record, in my view, is one of the great Blue Note releases, all the more remarkable for the fact that it was LaRocca's only release for the label. One can easily recommend it for the examples of his drum technique, and also because, strangely enough, it's a modal record which doesn't set out consciously or cerebrally to be a modal record. It just works out that way. It's the highlight of LaRocca's career. It's also one of the great early statements by Joe Henderson. It really belongs in any collection of hard bop from the 1960s, and for me, it's four and a half out of five stars.